first, a bit of background. I'm here because I'm kind of quite passionate about electric cars. Um, and while Clarkson was, was mocking them with, with vicious, mischievous glee, and we all saw that thing on Top Gear where um, they pushed the Tesla Roadster into the warehouse because it had run out of battery. Well, we now know that actually it hadn't run out of battery. It was in the script that it would run out of battery before the car was even delivered. So um, he set the kind of EV inquisitiveness in the public and the, the, the confidence in EV back years and years and years by a series of, of, of really vicious um, tirades against EVs. But while he was doing that, I was buying them with my own money and running them. Uh, and I started back in, what, 2010 with a little Mitsubishi Imiev, which did 50 miles to one charge if you were lucky, um, if you didn't put the heater on. Um, and then through Citroen C Zeros, Vauxhall Amperas, Leafs, um, Zoe's and, and now a Tesla, a Tesla Model 3. So I've done, I reckon, about 100,000 miles on battery-only cars. Um, and I know what consumers feel. And the interesting thing is that 10 years of broadcasting and talking about them, along with many, many other people, we still don't have that cut through to consumers. And this is what I want to talk about, three things today. Education, infrastructure, and manufacturing. And the education thing is really, really important because you still, in any conversation about EVs, get this haversack of doubts, myths, and, and, and urban, urban wives' tales about the fact that they can't go through car washes and there's going to be this huge, steaming, conical pile of toxic batteries. It's going to be even worse for us than the nuclear bombs that the batteries run out in five years and you have to replace them and it's going to scrap the car. And all this stuff shoulders its way in to the conversation whenever you talk to, to people. So one of the really important things we need to do is to educate people better. And we've now got empirical data over those 10 years and those millions and millions of miles that have been driven in electric cars to know that all this stuff is broadly untrue. And they do last. And we're seeing Teslas doing 150,000 miles on the original battery pack, Nissan Leafs 300,000 miles on battery packs, Chevrolet Bolts 250,000 miles on original battery packs. And we know that they are doing the range and covering the mileage. So as Opinion formers, as educators, as a university, you need to make sure that this is going out really empirically supported with the facts that we've got. Uh, Elon Musk has now 500,000 testers running around the world, which cumulatively have done a billion miles. That's really, really good data that proves so many things. So educating consumers is really, really important because I believe we're now at a watershed moment with the electric car. Um, I drove a, a Model 3 performance the other day um, and got 341 miles till the little light came on. That's amazing. That's all you need. That can be your only car. But okay, that's 50 grand, so it's not affordable. But if you look at a Kia e Nero, I drove one of those and I got 271 miles to one charge. And that's a 33 grand car. So we've almost slain the range anxiety dragon. And you can ask people to have these cars as their only car. I have a 24 kilowatt Nissan Leaf that I'm deeply fond of and have had for years and years and years and it hasn't cost me a penny, but it's the first gen EV. It only does 70 in the winter and 80 in the summer. And that's not a car you can use every day, but we passed that stage. And another watershed we passed is the fact that they are now around parity with ICE cars in terms of cost and ownership. So if you look at um, the salary sacrifice advantages, national insurance was coming in in April, you've got the benefit in kind, zero benefit in kind, you've got writing the, 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 the purchase cost off against capital um, uh, uh, corporation tax in your first year, and lots of other fiscal benefits, including the petrol, the lack of servicing that you'll need, you're almost at a stage now where total ownership costs and purchase costs after two years, you're about equal, and in some cases even less. And that's another thing we need to do. We need to do exactly the sums to show that these cars are now depreciating slower than ICE cars, cost infinitely less to service, the fuel savings really are considerable, 
and they are lasting the course and dispelling these myths one by one. But we also need to educate policymakers, MPs, ministers, civil servants, because there's a huge amount of um, ignorance there. Um, I was at a, 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 a meeting at the House of Lords the other day, and I said, OK, how many people in this room? And there were 70 people in this room. How many people have got an electric car? And just one baroness put her hands up and said, I'm the old bag in the Nissan Leaf you see in the slow lane doing 50 because I'm running out of charge. But 70 people and only one person owned and drove an electric car. And this is another part of the debate, that, that you really do need to drive these things to understand and to have a voice in the debate, because you won't understand it otherwise. You won't understand the challenges that we face. Um, I was at an investors meeting yesterday uh, talking about building EV infrastructure. And these are all high net worth people. Again, 50 people in the room. Put your hand up if you've got an electric car. Two of them, Teslas. And the rest, no. And then asked, have you driven an electric car? No. So that penetration, that cut through, just isn't happening fast enough. So we really do need to work hard on this. But the, the government issue is, is much more serious for me, because if you're talking to a minister, and I was talking to the Minister of Decarbonisation, who is no longer the Minister for Decarbonisation because he didn't get the job in the Cabinet reshuffle, and said, Minister, what are we going to do about the scalability of charges? where we can't just put 50 kilowatt ones down, we need 150, 200, because Tesla's approaching 250 with the superchargers and the V2. He looked at me and then he looked at his, um, his uh, special advisor and he had clearly, by the look on his face, never been asked this question before. How are you going to future-proof this infra infrastructure network? So when you've got that level of, 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 and the word is not cruel, ignorance, how are we going to build this? How are we going to make sure we get it right first time? So when we've got OLEV and we've got Go Ultra Low and, and we've got um, everybody, you know, DFT all pushing hard, but the knowledge they have is really, really limited. Which brings me on to the second point, which is infrastructure. Now, you won't get the public take up without the infrastructure because you won't completely banish the range anxiety. And it is that vicious circle. Um, and I with my other hat on, um, I'm the communications director and investor in a, an organization called EV Hub. And we are going to be building two um, EV Hub charging stations in London, King's Cross and Swiss Cottage. Um, so I've been going through all the, the costings and walking around the sites with the people from UK Power Networks and um, the district network operators. So I know how much it costs. And I'm here to tell you that there is no business model for this. It's going to cost you about a million quid to do what Sam said, which is your, your hubs, maybe 20 rapid chargers, and a lounge, and, and toilets, and communal facilities, and make it nice. So when the government say they're going to spend 400 million on an infrastructure, well, that's only bought you 400 hubs. There are 8,000 petrol stations. We need to do a lot better than that. And then when, when, when they say of the, the, the first 70 million of that money is going to be spent on 3,000 rapid chargers. Okay, let's do the maths. I know a rapid charger, if it's a scalable one that can go to 150 kilowatts, that's going to cost you 61 grand and 30 grand to install. So call it 100 grand over when the shouting is all, all, all done. So 100 grand into 70 million, that's not 3,000 rapid charging points, that's 700. So when they're getting the maths this wrong, it's kind of worrying. I know that a, a cable, to lay a cable, 900 pounds a meter. Now that's 1.6 million a mile. So if you're to bring that renewable electricity in, you're going to have to lay lots and lots of cables. So the cost of this is really it's titanic, and it's been underestimated. And to make it pay, you've got to think out the box, as Sam suggests, and, and create something different from the traditional fuel forecourt model. You've got to give reasons to come, destination charging. So we need to think out the box. We need to be creative. We need to add value to the whole thing to make sure that people come for a reason. We have a, a strap line with EV Hub, which is you, you, you chill, we charge. 
or work, rest and charge. And you create office space, you create 5G, you have Wi-Fi, you have Skype, you have FaceTime, so people can use them as offices and somewhere to relax between journeys. Because you will not have long distance commuting until you can fix this. So the government's ambitions are wholly laudable absolutely wonderful and I completely approve of them but they need to understand the nuts and bolts of this why do you think BP and Shell's efforts so far with Chargemaster and New Motion have been so slow and, and kind of timorous because it doesn't pay they can't convert fuel station forecourts to EV charging hubs the costs, the contamination issues the completely you know, reworking of them and the market's not ready yet, so you're not going to see that happen. And it's about private enterprise and public partnerships. So I, I go and I look at my invoice uh, for, for, for fitting this site out, and I'm paying 20% VAT. I'm paying business rates. I'm having to, to get planning permission. I'm having to write to HMRC to get investor, entrepreneur, tax relief. We should make this easier. And these are easy policy fixes. If you want a public-private partnership to build this network, then let's make it so the business case pays. Because if it doesn't pay, it just won't happen. And we will be marooned in the uh, hard shoulder, if we still have any. Um, and finally, let's talk about manufacturing. Let's talk about this, this thing that elbows its way into the room as well that we've got to cherish our, our car manufacturing industry in the UK because these are the people who are going to build these electric cars that will give us this brave, new, electrified future. And if we treat them as badly as we have been doing, we won't be able, or they won't be able, to sell the cars they've got, to afford the R&D, to build the cars we want. And that's really, really important. 800,000 jobs in the supply chain in automotive in the UK. Eight billion pounds contribution, GDP. What are we going to do? They are absolutely critical to this. And when I hear, you know, that we're going to stop the sales of new hybrid vehicles after maybe 2032, it's probably going to be 2030. And that's revealed that huge policy, vault fast, just like that. What are car manufacturers supposed to do? They've, they've got model cycles, they've got planning structures, they've got huge amounts of investments. And one minute they're told that we're going to have hybrids or plug-in hybrids or both, and then suddenly the metaphorical carpet is pulled from underneath them and they're sat there blinking thinking, what the hell happened? We've just blown a billion quid, two billion quid, three billion quid. So that kind of certainty, that future awareness of policy implications and the unintended consequences of those bad policy decisions, we've got to take them really, really seriously because this is a partnership, everybody. If we are to do this, if we are to take the public and the government and the manufacturers forward on this journey for decarbonisation and clear air and a new exciting power source, we have to do it in an informed, intelligent, fact-based way. So for me, the struggles are really quite serious. The amount of money you will have to spend on it is very, very significant, but the goals, and this is the important thing, the goals are huge. To make, as you said, Britain, the UK, a world-class centre for electrification is within our grasp. It really, really is, and Wales particularly, with all this re renewable energy, it's, it's, it's the perfect place. So the jobs we can create, the investment we can attract, and the exports we can generate by doing this right is really considerable. But doing it right first time, because you only get one, one chance at this. If you take too long and get it wrong, then we will lose the public and we will lose the, the finance for the manufacturers and the government will lose their credibility. So what happens in the next five years, and I do believe we've only got till 2030, is critical. And that's why we all of us really have to work as hard as we can to be together and make this journey successfully.